Mike Parallack here to entertain you. Um, this is going to be part five of my uh, film reflection of the Hellraiser series. I'll be covering the movie Seeker, the one that features the return of Ashley Lawrence uh, as her character of uh, Kirsty Cotton. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a reminder, a spoilers alert, because I'm going to be talking in depthly about this one. So if you don't want to um, have anything spoiled, Go watch the movie and then come back. I do love the uh, opening credit sequence of this one. Uh, kind of like uh, uh, a circumference going around and 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 around the box. Inferno did something similar, but it wasn't exactly the same. <clears throat> Anyways, okay, so Hellraiser's Hellseeker. Um, this movie opens with an accident. Uh, Kirsty and her husband are in their car, and they uh, accidentally drive over a cliff. Or the husband's self-serving way of remembering how it went. Um... It's indicated that he did something wrong. He did something wrong, and uh, you know, in regards to his relationship with his wife. But his wife is forgiving him. He says, uh, "We're going to work this out, right?" And he's like, "Yeah, we're going to work this out and everything." And so then he wakes up. And by the way, his name's Trevor. <laughs> wakes up complaining of headaches. <clears throat> he uh, falls back asleep, and in his dream, he's getting brain surgery. <laughs> interesting kind of brain surgery. <laughs> By the way, he woke he woke up in a hospital. <clears throat> but when he goes back under, he's having his weird dream where he's undergoing some sort of brain surgery and the surgeon tells him tells him, "We're helping you to remember, Trevor." He wakes up in the hospital again talking to Dr. Alice, who uh is the only character really treating him with kindness and compassion, saying that his head injury is pretty darn serious. The doctor comes in, the very doctor from his dream, and says, uh, apparently a doctor with a little more pull, and says, ah, it's no biggie, I'm sending you home. Let's save this bed for somebody who needs it. And then um, he inquires about his wife. Where's my wife? The detective walks in, kind of like a Jiminy Cricket-like character <laughs> at this point, uh, only more accu more uh, accusing, and says, that's what I'd like to know. You find yourself wondering if all the people um, in this story represent uh, his conscience, kind of like the Herman's uh, Head show. You kids from the 90s might remember that one. But anyways, he declines the detective's offer to ride to, for a ride home, goes home on the bus, <laughs> and is annoyed by this guy who's listening to rock music. He gets off the bus and encounters a scary dog. He gets home, he remembers his life with, uh, with his wife, Kirsty. At this point, uh, he remembers his life with her being just fine and dandy, in his mind. Next day, he goes to work. His co-worker, who is a who looks a lot, uh, who looks a who looks more like a beady-eyed version of Seth Meyers to me. <laughs> then he must, uh, you know, um, he must fall asleep again while he's at work because all of a sudden he's in a dark place. It seems to be a sewing factory. Creepy imagery, you know, horror movie stuff, and a f mysterious figure that says, I know what's in your soul. Then he wakes up to beady-eyed uh, Seth Myers, <laughs> that's what I'm calling the character, who tells him, eat a cookie. Maybe that'll, maybe your headache is due to low blood sugar. Have a cookie. <laughs> So he's in the break room at work and uh, comes across uh, Boss Lady, whom apparently he is having an affair with. She acts like they've been going at it for a while. 
but he's still in denial of his own sins, so is still confused when he watches himself as a willing participant on the surveillance camera later on. The detective calls and says, We found your wife. He goes to the precinct and actually um, they only found the car. He finds out when he gets to the, the police. He's told, The authorities believe your wife is missing and the car was drove off the bridge on purpose into the water. This time the detective not so accusing, saying he's just a guy trying to do his job, and between uh, uh, his head injury and the pain medicine, maybe he forgot something. Conceivable. It is at this point that Trevor starts to remember maybe his life with Kirsty was not as peaches and creams as he thought. So he takes the bus back home, sees the dog again, but this time the dog is whimpering at a creepy guy across the street. He sees the same guy in the apartment next to him and hurls water and an eel. Another dream sequence that is interrupted by a knock at the door from a character I'm going to call cute but stanky. But <laughs> cute, and, cute and skanky. The girl next door that he was apparently... Uh, <laughs> So, surprised, and again, uh, uh, self-denial, another uh, person he was having an, an acquaintance with, despite being with his wife, Kirsty. She's basically the next door skank who just, want, just had to show him her new tattoo because she knew he would like it. Uh, then he tells Miss Skank, not tonight, and then it's off to the closet to... Uh, Affirm, or to, to, re, to retrieve VHS home movies, affirming his wonderful life with Kirsty. In the, in the footage, Kirsty is happy to get a gift from him till she opens the wrapping to find this thing. As Hellraiser fans, we know. <laughs> Anyone who is a Hellraiser fan knows Kirsty Cotton does not have fond memories pertaining to this thing. <laughs> Another knock at the door and nobody's there. He looks around the hallway and when he comes back to his apartment, Boss Lady is in there. <laughs> in his home. Um, in, her, uh, in her underwear and ready to go. She, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, forces herself on him, which after a few moments she says, basically, okay, get off me, I'm not into this, I'm a good boy, I already have a good girl who tends to my physical needs, I don't need you or the cute skank next door. <laughs> Boss lady storms out, <laughs> saying, you can forget about that promotion. And that kid is what is known in the professional word as a professional world as a quiz pro quo. <laughs> so boss lady is gone, and old Trevor is left by himself watching the TV monitor that shows him and boss lady really going at it, <laughs> revealing to us the viewer that the video equipment is perhaps showing us the viewers Trevor's true nature. Next scene, we find Trevor wakes up at work, and we get the we get the view. We the viewers are once again looking at beady 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 eyed Seth Myers, his, his coworker. That's what I'm calling him. Who gives Trevor a number and a, and an address of someone who can help? Quote unquote. Turns out the person is an acupuncture specialist who tells him that his headaches are a product of his subconscious telling him to, trying to tell him something. He reverts back to the creepy dark place from earlier in the film and a mysterious character says again, I know what's in your soul. It is then shown that Doug Bradley is the mysterious character, but not Pinhead. 
So I guess Doug Bradley's doing dual roles in this one. <laughs> he says something to the effect, um, it is frustrating for you to have a wife so f eager to forgive you. And he makes reference to Le Merchant and the music box. And then it's back to the acupuncture table, table where Pinhead comes out of the wall, puts a pin in his neck, and says, Which do you prefer? More, or wh or which do you find more exhilarating, Trevor? The pain or the pleasure? Personally, I prefer the pain. Okay, and then it's back to the police precinct where he's told by a new a new guy on the case that his missing wife is now a homicide because her father and Uncle Frank had a truss willed to her for a rainy day. Trevor insists he had no knowledge of this. The new guy on the case says, maybe she didn't trust you. Now, I think it's indicated they were married for five years and Five years, not enough time to really know somebody. <laughs> I guess it's conceivable. <laughs> so it's back back to the home movies for more fun-filled revelations. <laughs> and another encounter with Cute and Skanky. <laughs> that has uh, apparently a violent end. Pinhead tells Trevor, All problems solved. A sequence that turns out to be all in his head because uh, he goes to Cute and Skanky's apartment to find she is alive and well and with another bow to keep her company. <laughs> back to his apartment and he goes back to his apartment and uh, gets a message on the phone from the original detective telling him there's been an interesting twist in the puzzle. When he gets there, back to the priest, police precinct, he is questioned about his relationship to Boss Lady. He sees his co-worker, beady-eyed Seth Myers, <laughs> um, um, the one, uh, you know, the one I'm calling beady-eyed Seth Myers, walking away and looks at him with an index finger to the lips. Then it is revealed in more in depthly on the video footage that he bought. Uh, the gift, the box, as a gift for Kirsty for their anniversary from the creepy guy at the sewing factory <laughs> who after uh, the transaction tells him the price is always much more but they all learn that in time. So it's off to visit uh, Angel, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Allison where he kind of confesses to her how much he misses his wife, Kirsty. She says, Sounds like you're getting your memory back. More and more. Maybe you were not the angel you thought you were. Back to work, where he tries to interrogate beady-eyed Seth Myers. <clears throat> his co-worker, who is very busy, but says he did not tell the police anything that they didn't already know. And then, surprise, surprise, the detective is waiting for him in his cubicle and tells Trevor, help me get my boss off my back and yours. They want to take you down from murder one. I believe you, but I'm the only one who does. Uh, then there's a private meeting in the break room for more revelation. Turns out BDI Seth Myers knew about Kersey's inheritance and Trevor and him had a plan to bump off Kirsty and share the money. He cuts his hand and then, or the Trevor cuts his hand and wraps it up. And then he's on, a bu uh, he's on the bus on the way home and calls Dr. Allison. She's not available. So it's back to the acupuncture lady, <laughs> who says, "Body, your body's all healed. The pain is all in your head, only in your head now. She says something to the effect, you need to surrender your soul to, to it. Your soul is trapped. Are you willing? And he says, he doesn't know what's real anymore. 
then she proceeds to prepare to stab him with an ice pick. <laughs> and he wakes up in the ambulance. <laughs> the paramedics ask him if he no rem remembers what happened to him. Trevor says something like, I was with a, a hot, naked acupuncture who tried to attack me with an ice pick. <laughs> to which the paramedics say, nope. <laughs> Not quite that good, buddy. You were in a you were in a bus and you passed out. <laughs> Finding himself, you know, Trevor finds himself back at the hospital. He inquires again about Doctor Allison, and is informed that there is, never was a Doctor Allison at that hospital. Never was. In anger, he storms out and runs into, almost miraculously, Dr. Alice in the hallway and confesses to her again. He thinks he might have done some terrible things, quote-unquote. Basically, she tells him, mistakes are a part of life. You are remembering everything at once, and it's a lot. She is just sorry she cannot be with him when the time comes for him to face total truth. And then the janitor interrupts, asking him, Buddy, why are you talking to the wall? <laughs> so, <clears throat> he uh, continues to wonder exactly what kind of a husband he was to Kirsty now that he is starting to see the sinful loser that he was. Still seeking answers and still somewhat in denial about his nature, he goes back to the sewing factory, but the place is now closed for business. He, he, he talks to Pinhead, who appears at, to him as his own reflection in a puddle of water. He accuses Pinhead of all his sins and runs out after being splashed in the face with dirty, nasty water. Creepy, mysterious figure and BDI Seth Myers are lurking outside. BDI Seth Myers again inquires about the plan to bump off Kirsty and share the money. And in his own fear of jail, puts a revolver in his mouth. But at this point, we the viewer know it's a smoke screen, a smoke screen to showcase Trevor's desperately trying to hold on to his own denial. And at this point, Trevor's character is so wrapped up in his own denial, he loses it, seeing things, random, brutal, random brutalities uh, here and there. Um, he's told that they found the body at the crash, at the accident site. A sliver of benevolent spirit, in there must be some little sliver of benevolent spirit still in him that wants to see truth. Because... The detectives demand, uh, because the other detective shows up demanding the truth from him. He also sees, uh, um, the, he, he gets a glimpse of a collection of photographs uh, from crime scenes, of photographs of all the females that he killed. <laughs> um, he also sees the guy that early in the film was the guy that was keeping uh, cute and skanky company in her apartment. And he's screaming his head off, He killed her! They're gonna fry you! He, uh, they're gonna fry you! <laughs> so the sequence earlier, where Trevor encounter with a cute and skanky that ended in violence, was not in his head after all. So at this point, the detective is basically talking, or just taking him to the precinct basement to his cell. He is surrounded by horror, imagery, and sound. I think it's this filmmaker's way of telling us, the viewer, that this is a lost soul, and this is his descent into hell. A hell of his own making. A private hell of his own making. More revelations about the detective and his real motives uh, come into play. Uh, he tells Trevor, Believe? Here's what I believe. You and I are the sum of two different people. <laughs> so, and further, uh, I guess, um, kind of showcasing the detective as his uh, uh, Jiminy Cricket, for lack of a better term. <laughs> so, uh, we the viewers 
start to question which people are real and which are made up and only exist in Trevor's head. The cell he was put in turns out to be a morgue where the body they found at the accident is covered with a sheet. He goes to remove the sheet expecting to see his drowned wife, dead wife. Kirsty. And that's what he expects to see. And, and the answer to all his questions. Enter Pinhead. In all his horror movie glory. He says, or uh, Trevor says, let me see my wife. Pinhead says, in time. He helps Trevor finally remember all. Explaining that he was only but a pawn in Pinhead's master plan to Laurel, quote, quote, a far more interesting creature. Back to his domain. Enter Kirsty Cotton. She is a far more interesting creature to Pinhead. <laughs> now at this point she knows about the three affairs um, Trevor was having, commenting at one point, all those women in our bed. In my op and in my opinion, a perfectly legitimate reason for any good, high-value female to be ticked off <laughs> and feel betrayed, not including the ones in real in the real world whom think they're high value on account of the modern feminism has inflated the toxic female ego to a proportion that is uh, destroying Western society. Okay, sorry. Back to hell. Back to hell seeker. <laughs> she knows about uh, the the th the three affairs. She knows about Trevor and his beady eyed uh, Seth Meyer coworker conspiring to bump her off and share an inheritance. But being the saint Kirsty Cotton is, I guess she's willing to forgive all tr forgive Trevor all that because he did state he loved her and she needed somebody to trust. However, his own destructive nature would be his own undoing. He just had to buy the box from creepy, mysterious figure Doug Bradley, giving Kirsty, uh, giving it to Kirsty as an anniversary gift, insisting she open it. She must figure out, okay, this guy wants to self-destruct. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. So at his request, she opens the box. The box that represents in this series truth and knowledge. I think Kirsty Cotton suspects he will not be able to deal with such things as truth and knowledge. And she says, right before opening the box, I hope it's everything you want it to be. Enter Pinhead and Kirsty's New Deal. She agrees to uh, give Pinhead five souls in exchange for her. Which Pinhead says, you would bring them to me yourself? <laughs> she says, you'll get your five. <laughs> yep, the three women that he had affairs with, the friend, and him. Five souls. <laughs> There's a... Um, some things that come into question in regards to uh, um, my opinion as far as like faith and Christianity and stuff. But I am happy to see the box ends up in uh, Kirsty's uh, possession, although it is still intriguing. <laughs> the characters in uh, um, that were all uh, in his mind were all people who were basically real people in the aftermath of the accident, especially Allison, who is basically a coroner's apprentice, <laughs> who is very spiritual, I guess, because she inquires, what if you were dead, and what if uh, what if there is no afterlife? Wouldn't you want somebody to talk to you like you were a human being one last time? Compassion. There is an alternative scene uh, where there's a little more dialogue involving where Pinhead tells her that Frank, Julia, and Larry are all in hell. In which I say, uh, Frank and Julia, yes, but Larry? I don't think so. And this goes back to my personal opinions and as far as uh, faith and redemption and all that stuff. Like I said in the first video, uh, why? what did uh, Larry do to justify have, condemning him to hell? 
except get involved with Julia. <laughs> in uh, Trevor's mind, uh, in, in reality, he shot himself just before the car went over the bridge. But in his mind, as I guess his final attempt to denial of his own ill, sinful self, Kirsty shot him in his mind because I guess in his heart of heart, that's what he wanted. Kirsty to shoot him. <laughs> Reminds me of something Pinhead says towards the end of this one. Welcome to the most horrible nightmare of all. Reality. This poor boy just couldn't deal with life. <laughs> Isn't that typical, though, of a crybaby narcissist? Much like the left. <laughs> But I came away having learned two things at the end of this movie. I learned the definition of the word atone, reparation for mistakes, uh, make amendments, chance for redemption. And don't flunk with Kirsty Cotton's heart. That's a lot. I'll try to get the rest of them out before Halloween, but no promises. I will get them out, but I just might, they just not be might not be out there before Halloween, that's all. <laughs>